presence of Mr. Shashi Tharoor. Kindly be seated. We'll start as soon as he arrives. I was at another event in Delhi. Traffic has become more and more difficult uh, to, to <laughs> overcome. But we are here for um, a session on innovation in education. We have a very distinguished panel. Uh, I have a few things to say myself, but given the fact that I've begun late, I'm not going to say it at the beginning, of, uh, but I will intersperse my comments uh, during the discussion as it goes along. Um, I think the idea is that we would start in the order that I've been given. So our first speaker is right next to me. Professor Tham Ming Po is from the Department of Engineering and Technology Management at the National University of Singapore. And uh, the idea is that each speaker would have about eight minutes to give you their perception and their thoughts about innovation in education from their own perspective. So, Professor Tham, you have the first go. Thank you, Minister. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to share with you an ongoing program uh, that NUS has with uh, Wallawaka Hospital. Uh, Wallawaka Hospital is in the township of uh, Devan, uh, which is about 300 kilometers uh, south of uh, Mumbai. Uh, and uh, it, it is, uh, Devan is one of the poorest uh, uh, township in the Maharashtra uh, state. Uh, Um, before I, I, I talk a little bit about the uh, cooperation with uh, uh, Wallawaka, I, I like to go back to this thing that we are calling uh, innovation. Innovation by itself, uh, even if you're talking about innovating for uh, advanced market, it is a very difficult uh, endeavor. Uh, and, and a gauge of that is that if you look at Amazon.com, and you key in uh, management of innovation, you will find about 20,000 of our books on the subject. And any company with uh, an innovation success rate of 50%, uh, that would be considered a company that is uh, right at the top of the uh, totem pole. So with that in mind, when we talk about uh, frugal innovation, uh, we are talking about uh, added elements of difficulty to the process of innovating for the BOP. For instance, when we talk about affordability, uh, reliability, all, all this, aside from the semantics, has to be taken into consideration uh, or, or evaluated against the, the community or the market in which the products will, will find their way. So, uh, it is with this in mind that we created that program with Walla Waka Hospital so that we could have students, engineering students, and engineering faculty living and working with the uh, intended customers. Something chocolate or DVD? Chocolate? Okay. So given that we are designing for uh, affordability, uh, reliability, maintainability, uh, and, and uh, adaptability. How do we, or how do the students are going to translate this into engineering spikes? Because without the spikes, you can't build a product. Without the products, you have no sense of uh, costing or what sort of business model to adopt, right? So, um, with that said, uh, engineering faculty, people uh, with, uh, the first time we went to Wallawaka was with uh, 13 students uh, from different uh, departments, uh, engineering departments. We had uh, students from mechanical engineering, industrial systems, uh, electrical engineering, and these 13 uh, students were from China, uh, Bangladesh, Indonesia, uh, Singapore, and uh, of course, uh, Indian students who, who came back to, to work with Wallawaka. Uh, what they are supposed to do in Wallawaka is uh, to, or the arrangement that we have with Wallawaka Hospital is because they, they don't have a, a established workshop or any uh, engineering labs. So what we agreed to do with them is that the students, after they have identified the needs of the, the what, whatever uh, uh, problem that they have uh, observed and they have come up with uh, needs identification, they will build crude prototypes uh, on the Wallawaka campus, 
right? They refine the prototypes and they use the prototypes to talk to the uh, doctors, talk to the uh, nursing aides, and then they will come back to uh, Singapore to build the high resolution <coughs> prototypes. And then when it's done, uh, during the next school break, they will go back to Walla Waka to do full scale testing. And so this would be an iterative process until the students graduate, and then we have a new batch of students who will take over from this current batch. Right. So uh, what we want the, the students to, to do in Walla Waka is uh, learning how to observe and to ask questions. This may sound like, you know, what's so difficult about seeing or what's so difficult about asking questions, but engineering students, like I, I would say engineering students everywhere, they don't speak up in class. They will just keep quiet. And they're very good at solving problems when the problems is given to them. This is just like the, the situation you find in the three idiots, right? They will go look up the textbook, give you a textbook answer, and they consider themselves to have done well if you give them 100 marks or whatever. But the thing is, what do you do when you're thrown into a situation that you're not familiar with? So we have kids from Singapore, city kids, who have never set ho uh, foot in a village in, 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 say, Malaysia, let alone India. What or how would they adapt and how would they find opportunities to innovate? And this is exactly the kind of situation we want to expose them. So uh, this, this is a, a mobile clinic uh, that is being, as, as you can see in the picture, uh, being set up in the home of a sponsor. The sponsor is someone in the village that has volunteered his home for the day for the clinic to be set up. And the reason why they have all these mobile clinics in uh, Walla Waka is because it's very difficult for the uh, villagers to make their way to the hospital, so they have to bring the service out to the, to the villagers. So what you see here is the nursing aides together with the drivers setting up the, the clinic. And before they can even treat the patients, it takes them two hours just to set up shop. So this is a very data-rich environment but the needs are not articulated in any way or made obvious to the students. So the students have to observe for themselves and find opportunities to innovate and maybe create devices, you know, wh whatever they could see uh, as opportunities in there uh, to create something to help the, the, uh, uh, the nursing aides, right? So, and again, here you see that uh, the ladies they have to carry this heavy table up to the upper levels of the, the sponsor's home. And the reason is because uh, that, that particular section would be devoted to a, a cervical cancer uh, examination, and that upper part of the, the house provides a better uh, privacy. Right. Okay, so this is something which uh, Chris alluded to yesterday, uh, the, the uh, pressure cooker being converted into an autoclave. So again, if you were to talk about, we are going to give you something better, better in what sense, right? They already have something workable. So what does better mean? Right, so I'll just skip along. Now this is again a uh, uh, one room uh, uh, schoolhouse which was converted to a, a, a clinic to treat uh, malnutrition, right? That little white building that you see there is the, is the makeshift uh, clinic, right? And here you see, uh, blood being taken with a syringe uh, uh, device, right? And the, uh, on the right side, you can see the nurse sort of uh, looking at the uh, hemoglobin uh, level uh, based on the color uh, that she's matching against a, a, a reference. And here you see blood again being drawn by a mouth suction device, right? So again, this is what they are used to uh, using so what does it mean by I'm going to give you something better, right? These are the things that help the students explore and look at alternatives that they can provide to these guys and um, you, you know, uh, get them to switch over to, a, to a, a new device when they already have something like that, right? So, so uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to wrap up here but this is an ongoing program. So we have students going out to uh, the, the clinic 
And uh, this is my last slide, absolutely. And uh, you, you can see here, right? You can collect the data, but if the data is in this kind of a format, right, which is mostly incomplete because the, the nursing aides are not literate, then how are you going to track the efficacy of the treatment process that you're implementing in the co uh, community? So these are the type of uh, uh, situations or scenarios which we expose the students to and hoping that uh, through this kind of uh, experience, they can come up with uh, solutions that are uh, you know, not, not found in textbooks or, or in any printed material. All right, thank you. Thank you, Professor Thiam, and I'm sorry that I cramped your style a little bit by pressing you to finish. We are on a very tight schedule, and so I will have to race through these presentations in the time allotted, but thank you for that. And I'm afraid those who are farther away from me than Professor Tiam and Mr. Paracharya may have me interrupting them with that. I've been given very strict instructions on the clock. All right, our next speaker is the Secretary for School Education in the Ministry of Human Resource Development, Mr. Rajashi Paracharya. Rajashi is on my right. You have the floor, Rajashi. Thank you very much, sir. I uh, start at the beginning and uh, with the question that what is education for? And if education is first and foremost for peace and development, India has a very robust, innovative framework for carrying that through. Why do I say it? I say it because every child in school has the opportunity to imbibe the aspirations of the nation. The aspirations of the nations are contained in the preamble to the Constitution and construct his, his or her own aspiration to resonate with the nation's aspiration. Secondly, Every child has the opportunity to imbibe the conscience of the Constitution and construct his or her own conscience to resonate with the nation's conscience, which is absolutely secular. Our Constitution has a conscience. It is quoted by histori historian Granville Austin and has been referred to by President Shankar Dal Sharma in the joint session of Parliament to commemorate the 50 years of the Constituent Assembly and the conscience is the core of the social commitment to the nation and if an individual resonates both in the aspirations and the conscience you have peace and development being carried forward in the ultimate definition which is required to be that sort of robust framework contributes to our own subsequent all the steps taken for this our country is a union of states 35 states and union territories and it has more than 1600 mother tongues 1652 even though recent census on mother tongues has not been constructed uh, has not been uh, done the people's linguistic survey carried out over a number of years in the recent past showed that more than 800 mother tongues exist a state like assam which is the size of england has 52 mother tongues our education policy says that Education should be teaching, learning should be carried out preferably in the mother tongue. So what does it translate to? In a state like Assam, is it 52 mother tongues in which it is carried out? Or in a state like Odisha, which has a huge number of tribal dialects, in what language does it, is it carried out? Every state carries out its education in its mother tongue defined. So in a state like Odisha, it is 19 tribal dialects in which teaching, learning methodology is there, in which tribal teachers are taken and used for absorbing them into the regular system and that's a huge challenge which we which we address through our own innovative framework some of which I have just referred to third point is our region South Asia region contributes to the largest number of non literates and we do have a large number though we have made immense progress in uh, literacy going up to 73 percent decreasing gender gap but we have been doing what is called basic literacy teaching, reading, writing and arithmetic and we have had no independent assessment of this literacy as such except the census being carried out once in 10 years and somebody saying that the person has been uh, made literate. We have started a totally independent assessment of this literacy through the National Institute of Open Schooling in which annually two examinations are done and the ability to read, write, and do arithmetic, general awareness, social awareness, and others is carried out, and a certificate given through this independent body. In the last three years, through this innovative approach, 21.3 million such 
uh, uh, certification of literacy has been done and when we relate it to our ICT, the records of all these are available in the public portal for anybody to go and verify the teacher who has taught the, the non-literate person the level of literacy which has been achieved. It is there in the sakshar-bharat.nic portal. That is a web-enabled planning and MIS system portal which we have designed recently to manage our literacy programs. We are putting on record 100 million learners' data, of which database of 80 million has been completed. Half a million literacy program managers' data are there, showing who is teaching whom in which village, in which environment, along with the 2 lakh implementing agency. But this basic literacy does not carry forward a long distance in the life of any individual. So we are moving forward to do what is called basic education, to try and give them opportunity to do at least the equivalent of a couple of years of schooling until we reach that, there are certain other essentials which are being uh, innovatively designed to take them forward in life. One aspect is electoral literacy, which we have entered into a memorandum of under understanding with the Election Commission of India. ECI has not entered into any MOU with anybody. First time it has entered into an MOU with us to teach electoral literacy. We are trying to take it forward to do financial literacy and legal literacy so that at least the non-literates have the survival tools for surviving and understand the environment and take them forward in that direction. Once they do some of the basic education, they should be available and a system should be available for testing them. We have the biggest open schooling system in the world, which is the National Institute of Open Schooling through which they can undergo the test whether it is class 5 or class 8 or class 10. And this innovative approach started in this NIOS is a system of on-demand examination because non-literate people may be working in the fields, working in the environment. The number of such centers we are continuously increasing so that any person can go to any of the centers, demand the examination. There's a huge data bank of the questions related to the local areas and others which are put there. We now come to the area of the regular schooling where the recent innovative approaches include the continuous comprehensive evaluation and the no detention policy. The continuous comprehensive evaluation system has replaced the annual examination so that there is no stress on the child, but it has increased the workload of the teacher tremendously because unlike a certain perception that examinations have been done away with, it involves more examination because if a student is there in a class and there are 40 students, the teacher is expected to understand the level of learning of each and every child and evaluate at that level and carry out the teaching methodology for that person. No detention doesn't mean no examinations, it means more examination. It means that the teacher is responsible for ensuring that the child reaches the minimum degree of learning. Uh, to do that, we need, we need classrooms of small sizes, small not in physical size, but in terms of numbers. So the government of India and the state governments have sanctioned a huge number of teachers. More than 20 lakh teachers posts have been sanctioned, 14 and a half lakhs have been appointed, so that the pupil-teacher ratio decreases at the national level, it is now 30, but there are huge distortions there at within the country, uh, within the states, which we are trying to do rectification. Once we do this system of comprehensive continuous evaluation, we need to have the examination systems in position for doing that, enable the teachers, and those tests are carried out through continuous formative assessment and at the end of it, there are two summative assessments which are done for which recently we have also devised a huge series of question data banks in which every school can generate its own summative assessment test on a random basis and carry out the test on which the, the analysis is also done by the Central Board of Secondary Education for the assessment, evidence of this assessment as to how qualitatively it has been done. We have also made a huge focus for early grade reading, writing, maths with activity-based learning with an innovative approach and uh, our colleague uh, Dr. Ramji Raghavan would also be referring to some of the very substantive innovative approaches which are being carried out in this method. I'll take one more minute to conclude because there are two, three other points uh, which are to be stated. Uh, we have started our problem-solving assessment system from the year 2012-13 in the CBSE and are working on a system of accreditation for the schools where the CBSE has completed a pilot and developed a manual on school assessment. We have started optional proficiency test in class 10 because till class 10, otherwise there is no examinations which is there. 
We are also working on uh, on-screen marking by the CBSE and plan, uh, planning online and virtual labs. We have the biggest midday meal program in the whole world, covering nearly 110 million children, and we are working on an in IVRS-based system on mobile telephony to do online monitoring of that to ensure that midday meal is served qualitatively in each and every school which exists. Two other points which I would like to state before I conclude in another 30 seconds. We have a private public partnership in schools for 2,500, first time which has been done in India, carried forward. And to capture all this is a huge data bank of 1.5 million schools in which we do a UDICE collection of data started from the 2012-13, otherwise it was to be a database based on primary school, upper primary school, secondary schools. We have combined all of them together. It covers 460 variables and does monitoring on ev each and every aspect. And the biggest program that we have, Sakshar Bharat program, to carry forward our right to education, it is an MIS online tracking of this with 2.52 lakh sub-district points of expenditure being financially tracked. Thank you very much for the opportunity given. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bharacharya. I'm sorry that we are rushing everyone, but it's, it's uh, the only way we can hear this wide diversity of voices. And I should have mentioned that we're pleased to see Sam Petroda back here. And uh, very briefly, we had an innovative film director sitting next to him. He's disappeared. He's just coming back. He's coming back. Shekhar Kapoor, uh, the director of Elizabeth, is listening to us. Our next speaker is Mr. Ramji Raghavan, chairman of Augusta International Foundation. Mr. Raghavan, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Tharoor. In 2008, on a hot summer's day in rural India, two village girls, Rani and Roja, sat under a tree to escape the hot sun. Rani looked at Roja and said, you know, Roja, do you ever wonder why you feel cool or cooler sitting in the shade of a tree? And Roja thought for a second and looked up and said, well, yeah, maybe it has something to do with the fact that the leaves and branches of the tree are shielding us from the sun. And the girls continued chatting for a while until the aha question popped out. What different leaves have different cooling effects? And that question led to a project titled, not surprisingly, The Cooling Effect of Leaves. And working with instructors from my foundation, the Augustia Foundation, nine months later, the girls won a prestigious Intel Iris National Science Award, competing with the best and brightest kids from across India. Poor village kids, the daughter of a carpenter, the daughter of a marginal farmer. Now, what does this story tell you? I think it tells you the value of curiosity, the spirit of inquiry, the magic of wonder, the power of passion, staying with the problem. Einstein attributed his remarkable insights to curiosity, obsession, and dogged endurance. The mission of Augustia, the foundation that I had, is to spark curiosity, nurture creativity, and help instill self-confidence and self-belief in economically disadvantaged children and rural school teachers across India. And we're doing this touching over a million children a year through 75 mobile science labs that crisscross the countryside in 12 states in India, our creativity lab, a 172-acre campus close to Bangalore, where we've built a whole bunch of hands-on learning centers, 33 satellite science centers, and most recently, uh, we won the Google Global Impact Award for our new Tecla bike, a lab on a motorcycle with a laptop, and touching, as I said, a million kids a year in ways they've never been touched before. It's all hands-on and experiential. Why hands-on? Because cognitive scientists tell us that you retain no more than 5% of a lecture in your long-term memory. 50% of what you see and hear, 70% of what you discuss with someone, 80% of what you personally experience, good or bad, we can all relate to that, and over 90% of what you teach to others. So we have a program where we also teach children to teach children. It's called the Young Instructor Leader Program. Rani and Roja were members of that program. And members of that cadre of young instructors have been winning the Intel Iris Award now for five years in a row. Now, none of this would have been possible without the help of government. We work closely with government, without whom we can't possibly scale up. 
So our dream is to replicate the model that we have built in Karnataka, in Andhra Pradesh, in other parts of India, and that's what Rajrishi was referring to. And I hope we can work with Delhi to make that happen. Having said that, let me end by saying that we have a vision of a nation of curious people. I think curiosity will solve most of our problems. And having said that, I'd now move over to a very, very short film. Uh, they say uh, you can't believe what you hear, but possibly you would what you see. So let's show the film. It's about two minutes, and hopefully I'm within your... If it's two minutes, you are, sir. Well done. Thank you. Where the three southern states of Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu meet, just a two-hour drive from the city of Bangalore, Agastya International Foundation occupies a 172-acre campus. This campus is the main hub for mobile labs that take lessons in science, math, ecology and art to village schools and communities. In the midst of rural India, Agastya's campus provides a hands-on science museum for children which has one rule, please touch, challenging young minds, sharpening motor skills and drawing on familiar stories. Square wheel bike. At one end of the spectrum are the durable, elaborate models used in the Discovery Center and carried to science fairs. At the other end are low-cost experiments and models that can be easily and inexpensively replicated. Scientists who come to instruct teachers and conduct research on the Augusta campus have freedom to experiment with their own methods of teaching and to share the knowledge acquired over their illustrious careers. Teachers from rural areas rub elbows with some of the great scientific minds of India. While scientists, artists and other visitors instruct the teachers and children, some of the children are also selected for the Young Instructor Leader Program. Children are selected to be young instructors when they show special interest and skill. Agastya also reaches communities through science fairs which come into town with all the excitement of a traveling circus. For a few days, young instructors demonstrate low-cost experiments and elaborate models to children from the local schools. Integrated learning, art, dance, as well as science and math are taught on the campus. This engages the child's mind and body so that science and math come alive in new and different ways. Mobile labs visit rural villages after dark and whole families gather at a central location, often illuminated only by the lanterns the vans carry. Communities learn about the importance of ecology, the value of Ayurvedic plants and other lessons useful in their lives. As the spirit of Agastya spreads throughout the country and around the world, it is bringing the rural poor to the table as India makes her mark on the global scene. Thank you very much, and that was indeed effective. Since you still have a minute left, you seem to have literally reinvented the wheel. Now, can you tell us how a square wheel works and why? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not a math uh, uh, or science student. But I appreciated why a round wheel works and gives you a smooth ride after we constructed the square one. <laughs> what I was told is, as long as you maintain the distance from the axle to the ground constant, you can get a smooth ride on any shaped wheel. So what the scientist did was, he said, uh, you've got to vary the surface, rather like our roads in Bangalore now, <laughs> right? And it's called a cantilinear surface, and there's a mathematical relationship between the sort of half perimeter of the, sur of the surface and the square wheel. And uh, he's a Caltech guy, ex-NAL uh, man, and I said, this is a fun project. When we get VIPs like Mr. <laughs> Tharoor to visit the campus, I'd like them to ride the square wheel and never forget it. I'm but sure it's turned I'm. out to be a great thing for spotting gifted kids. 
The other day there was a boy, we have a gifted children program that we're working with Dr. Chidambaram on. And there was a boy sitting there staring at the square wheel and the guy running the program for us asked him, what are you thinking? And he said, you know, I'm thinking what other shapes would give you a smooth ride? This is a village kid. So he said, what other shape do you think would do it for you? And he said, a triangle. So I said, really, how would you do that? And he said, wait a minute, I think a triangle with equal sides, an equilateral triangle. And uh, the spotter came to me and said, this is no kid with an average mind. He's got very advanced conceptual skills. So the square wheel cycle, you know, paid off in some way, I guess. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mr. Raghavan. We now turn to Dr. Aris Mani of NIC, who will tell us about India's National Knowledge Network. You have the floor. Good afternoon. Uh, in this particular uh, few minutes of session, I'll just explain what NKN is. And it was the initial phase of NKN, uh, which was started with the 100 crores budget, uh, was inaugurated in 2009, April, by the Honorable President. And then the whole idea of connecting all these knowledge institutions was mooted in National Knowledge Commission and the PSA's office, and being implemented by NIC with 5990 crores for 10 years. If you see the logo itself, the NKN logo in the middle, it's actually an output uh, outcome of uh, meeting with uh, Sam Petrodasar and uh, PSA and one of our member institution, NID in Ahmedabad, and one of the professor Vyas was the person who actually designed it, and uh, it was actually given the color scheme like blue sky uh, research and then green technology, and KI in the middle talks about the knowledge integration. So basically the need of the R is to have a platform which can be used by everyone, whether it's education, research, governance, or any other. And then create a network which is QS aware, which is quality of service aware, a network which can be scalable, adaptable, and also available, 24 cross 7. And to basically enable, encourage, and empower, and enrich the institutions which are connected on it. So if you look at the uh, the core of the network, it, it's like a national highway. So we have all the major state capitals connected with uh, multiple 10 g gigabits per second, which can be scaled for multiple uh, hundreds very soon. And then the different colors which you see is to create the availability by taking it from different service providers, which these service providers, of course, didn't have this technology at that time. So it was created as a model in which the NKN tried to create the technology in their company and then try and give the service delivery model. Coming to this particular slide, the stake, the members of NKN, if you have a look at it, it, it nearly covers all educational institutes, all the research institutes, all the national data centers of the government and the state uh, data centers of the state government as well as the networks of various state government and national uh, central government. It has got an internet connection, which is of course a more, one of the most important to acquire knowledge, and also connectivity to various international research educational uh, networks like GIANT and TN4 in the Trans-Eurasia network, etc. Uh, I'll just skip the status. Today we have a huge presence. We have around 1,026 uh, institutes connected on uh, NKN. And if you have a look at the spectrum, the way they are divided, it's like every state we have at least 20, 25 of them in that. And some of the states like Karnataka has got more than 100. Actually last uh, October we finished the 100th one in Karnataka. So uh, the, the core of the network, to make it more available and scalable, you can see that it has got uh, super cores, which are basically seven, which is the yellow one, connected with multiple connections, creating a huge highway for uh, communication and collaboration. Then the other states are connected to t three different super cores and then there goes the district where we are trying to reach out to the districts, all the 640 of them. The international connectivity, if you have a look at it, we have today a 2.5 gigabit link which goes all the way from Mumbai to Madrid and then in the same way we have a 2.5 going from Mumbai to Singapore. The idea is that, that we have uh, BRC in Anushakti Nagar doing a crystallography in one of the labs in uh, uh, France. So they take a lab time and then do a remote lab uh, using this. 
Under one of the projects like NMEICT, we have a lot of virtual labs being created so that students from any part of the country, any part, any you know, remote area can use those labs. Otherwise, they have to buy those expensive tools. So we are trying to host all those virtual labs on NCAN so that uh, these students can make use of that. Uh, by March 2014, we aim to have an uh, international prop at uh, Singapore and uh, Geneva and CERN, and then in Amsterdam and in New York, so that we can reach out and connect to Internet2, uh, Gloriad, Canary, and various other networks in the U.S. and uh, in the other area of uh, Europe. Uh, basically, NCAN is the national research network creates an infrastructure where scientists can collaborate and most importantly all this interdisciplinary collaboration so that an output can be generated. So this is the research education network for the country. We have a lot of applications like we have virtual classrooms then various other uh, applications working on NKN and then we have grids such as the brain grid. We have a set of uh, labs in the country which are connected and a virtual private group has been created for this with uh, NBRC leading that project. So we have similarly climate modeling, we have a LHC grid like the CERN one and the TFR leading that one. We have a lot of services. We found that you know without these services on the network it becomes very difficult for each one of those organizations especially coming from medical area. We have a huge number of medical uh, institutions on board. All the aims and uh, big hospitals and various medical colleges on board. So we thought that why not offload their IT activity centrally. So we have all those uh, activities which are required for any network uh, available centrally on the NKN. So some of the services which we mentioned are here. For instance, all the authentication services, storage on the network just like your Dropbox anywhere. Performance monitoring if you're a research, uh, uh, if you're a researcher and you want to see whether you'll get a bandwidth of uh, 400 Mbps from here to California. So you need to really check that. So there are some tools we have put on the network. Again, uh, they're all open source developed by uh, Internet2 and we have collaborated with them and put that on the network so that you can actually find out from Mumbai or from Delhi uh, how much bandwidth will you actually get from here to Washington or any other place. We have a uh, lot of other tools as a, as a network operations team. We ourselves face a lot of difficulties. So we thought that why not create those small tools which will be made available to all the end institutions like uh, NITs or central universities and other places, which again has got a huge network inside their campus. It's not a small network because it's just a huge campus and they have huge multi-gigabit networks inside. So I said that they can also use those tools. So we are trying to create that. And uh, one of the important thought process that came in and uh, we have just started working with uh, INCOIS and uh, IITM in Pune is to create a DR for each other. Now that each one of those institutions have got a huge pipe, huge bandwidth with them, so why not they have a disaster recovery or a business continuity plan in the other institution which is collaborating with them so that they can have a set of servers there, keep the database there and try to create a BCP. So I'll just finish in one minute. Sir. So we have webcasting services which are all coming in and uh, we, we are doing these kind of services which are going to come in before March 2014. Uh, to just showcase the network's uh, efficiency, we have few model projects which is basically collaborative projects where scientists uh, like IIT professors from computer science background are working with uh, people in dentistry in AIMS to create castings and things like that. So there are a lot of projects on the and there are a few new projects which are going to take the blue ones are the new projects which are going to be approved in next maybe a month or so. There is a project on biodiversity which is again very important for the nation today. Some of the challenges we are trying to now address because as a huge network we need to understand uh, various things. So we are trying to collaborate with NITs and uh, Dr. Sam was there in the National Institute of uh, Technology meeting with, uh, where the president took the meeting of all the directors. We're trying to work out some innovative mechanism to uh, try and find out how we can actually take care of this. And indigenization, which is again a, a big push which is going on. We have uh, started working on few products which fits in different parts of this particular network to make sure that we are able to uh, run the show better way. And at the end, when we see this particular figure, it shows if, I, if we connect all the points of NKN, that is all the 1,500 members and uh, various other links, it'll look something like this. Each dot actually shows a point of presence. 
So one of the experiment that was done, sir, in Maharashtra was a Pandarpur experiment where the one gigabit link which goes up to the institute was further uh, distributed in the way of uh, Wi-Fi and WiMAX, etc., to rural schools where they had those tablets to really read those uh, exercises given to them. So if you have so many points which has got a huge bandwidth connection to them, so what we try and see is that, that this could be a distribution point for further taking it to the rural area and try and uh, showcase all those things that are there. So with that, I would like to stop here. Thank you so much. And we have connected so far 1,026 institutions. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Mani. Thank you for uh, agreeing to my request to <laughs> cut it short. I'm sure there's a lot more he could have said, but we, the clock races against us. Dr. Sujata Ramadurai is, the, is a professor at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and a member of the National Innovation Council. Dr. Ramadurai. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be talking here. I'm going to be showing you three different slides. They might seem disparate. The only connection is me. And uh, they all have certain aspects of innovation in them. And uh, so let's start with the first slide. Yeah. So this is MITAX, which stands for Mathematics in Information Technology and Computer Science. So this is one of the leading success stories, I would say, of Canada in the last decade. So it began in University of Toronto and began to spread quickly to other universities. What they do now is run a very successful program called Global Inc., wherein they get students from around the world to come and work in projects which are at the interface of in industry and academia. And this has succeeded in not just bringing students from different parts of the world to work on focused problems, which then leads them to a degree or you know, long-term projects and so on. It has also helped spawn a whole wide network of connections with different countries. For instance, the latest uh, country to join this was Australia. Australia invited MITAX to come and help them set up something like that in their country uh, to speed up things between uh, you know, at the interface of industry and academic interactions. This is a model that has been proven to work. And what is very strong about this project, at least a thing that I like, is the mobility aspect of it, wherein they bring students in the final year of their degree to work on a focused problem, and uh, which gets both the academics excited and also the industry is looking for a solution. So this is now in operation with Mexico, Brazil, and uh, Australia, as I said, and they are looking seriously to partner with India on a variety of problems. That's one. The next slide. Oh, sorry, this is the previous one. Okay, so the next one is again something to do with India, Canada. This is IC Impacts, Indo-Canada Impacts. This is uh, slightly different from Globalink. It's more oriented towards the academic community, but they are working on problems which uh, global challenge, which go under the rubric of global challenge problems, you know, sustainable growth, infrastructure, health, water, and so on. So this is another area where partnerships can develop. And in my brief time in Canada in the last two or three years, I find that that's a strength that we should build on, be sending youngsters from, you know, we, we have this challenge at higher education. We are not going to be able to provide uh, resources for everybody in such a short time. But on the other hand, how do we not waste the enormous talent that we have and the potential that we have? And for me, the solution is clearly in, is in building links and sending youngsters on such mobility programs and also to get them to have a fr first-hand look. One of the success stories, which is uh, part of this, but it, it's not directly a part of this initiative, was something run by the NGO. There's a very famous NGO in uh, uh, Canada based in Vancouver called Maiva, which works with Indian artisans. And when they, each year they come to India, and then they are just absolutely bowled over by what they see here, and they go back and sell the things. Of course, their design is slightly tweaked and so on. And then it's such a hit in Canada that you have many of the people there wanting to be a part of it. So this has developed into a kind of cultural tourism. And more, it brings, this uh, organization brings the artisans from India to Canada for a live demonstration of the kind of things that they can do. And it has, it's almost like a big event in Vancouver when these artisans come. But related to this is also a scientific problem. Like one of the batch of students, when they came to India, they found that a group of textile weavers were looking for better mordants in their dyeing, for which they went back to their labs, found a solution, and then brought it back and shared it with the community of weavers in India. So there are enormous possibilities. Or when you had a group of business students from Canada come to India, 
and do a case study on the uh, healthcare for the eye operations, you know, Arvind Netralia and Shankar Netralia and all of it. This was a serious business case study that was done and the learnings of which they tried to implant back in Canada. So I see tremendous opportunities here and we should not let go of them. My last slide is something that's slightly different. I believe strongly that the future of learning is in learning out how to learn. And there should be a whole genome of future learning. And, you know, learning anytime, anywhere, anyhow. That's the mantra. And I was pleasantly surprised when I taught in my classes in Canada to see the students not writing down a word, but at the end of it just photographing everything on the board and doing equally well in the examinations. So the way students are learning is changing, you know, taking different kinds of paths that we are not even aware of, that we are in no way in a position to even comment whether it's going to work or not going to work. And technology intervention is one such area. And in India for a long time, there was this debate about how do we usher in technology in the classroom? Should we do it at all? Is it going to replace teachers? Thankfully, now I feel that we have grown over those questions. And it is still in our interest to see and to learn, to help the teachers and the student community know that technology is not meant to displace teachers. It can never do that. But together with teachers, it can leverage the experience of teaching and learning to a great deal. So a group of us want to create online resources starting with mathematics in the regional languages in India. We do want to do it in a very informal manner and hopefully have academics contribute to it at the level of school education because this is something that academics have not been seriously involved with. And my hope is that if it succeeds, then other, champ other people champion other areas so that ultimately we have classrooms where we just have the hardware with no software. And this is the content part of the technology intervention in the classrooms that's absolutely essential and where we need, uh, we don't know what's going to work. There's something still, nobody quite understands how the teaching learning happens fully. So we need a multitude of experiments, we need a variety of approaches and this is one of them that I'm experimenting with a few of uh, my colleagues and friends, and I wanted to talk about that here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amazon. Thank you very much for uh, keeping to the clock without needing to be reminded of it. And the final speaker on our panel is the Director General of the National Council of Science Museums, Mr. G.S. Rautela. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak. Oh, I was not scheduled to speak in this session, but Anyway, I got an opportunity to talk to about a small initiative that we have started with National Innovation Council. Just before I talk about that project, I would like to talk about a little about the science museum movement in the country. It is a uh, government-inspired program uh, called National Council of Science Museums, which sets up science centers in the country. We have 48 of them at the moment. It's the largest network under one umbrella in the world. And the faster growing network will be 66 by the 2017 and 32 more after that already approved. So this program is basically uh, with two major objectives. One is <coughs> creating awareness on science and technology in society. And the second is, uh, is motivating and inspiring young children to take interest in science and technology. So, and we have 12.5 million uh, annual visitors in the science center at the moment. And we run 23 mobile exhibition vans throughout the country. We tour about eight months in a year to remote areas of the country in the schools and cover about 2.5 million school kids. And this is a, a program running for the last 34 years, a very successful program. Now coming back to uh, the, um, today's uh, the present that I would like to give, the decade of innovation agenda forward, if you have to take it, Indian Science Museum Center tied up with the National Innovation Council to um, spreading India's innovation initiatives. So one of them is creating innovation spaces in science centers and science museums across the country. So uh, we divided our country into uh, five regions, north, south, east, west, and northeast, so that we set up initially five uh, such centers. Uh, one of them has already been opened in Kolkata two months back, and we are opening two this uh, in December, and another two by January end. So we'll have five centers in five zones of the country. The basic objective of this is to inspire, engage young students in, into innovative activities. Uh, why science centers are rightly positioned to take up this initiative is India has the largest and fastest growing network. Uh, it partners, um, the partner number would become 67 by 2017. 
and uh, the presence in urban and semi-urban and rural areas everywhere. We have three models of science centers for rural, semi-urban and urban areas. And uh, we have a uh, youth-dominated clientele. 3.5 million students visit us every year. And um, in the business of making science and technology mathematics interesting to, through hands-on activities, I call not only hands-on, even the minds-on activities, well-equipped workshops and design facility, and experienced technical and educational support staff, and a strong networking with academia and science and technology institutions, and collaboration with international networks. This all is in place. That's the reason we are, uh, have a capacity to build science centers on uh, turnkey basis. What are the objectives of this uh, innovation space? To engage our youth in creative hobbies and activities, and to promote their critical thinking by problem solving abilities, to support their innovative ideas, to come to fruition, uh, uh, and to recognize, encourage, and reward youth uh, engaged in reno uh, innovation activities. So annual innovation fairs we propose. So what are the components of these spaces that we have created? We have one hall of fame where we celebrate the inventions, inventors, and innovators uh, through exhibitions and portals and um, computer kiosks. We have an innovation resource center, part of this, which is uh, online access to innovation-centric resources, e-journals, YouTube videos, full-length videos, books and grassroots uh, innovation portals, etc. So one can access all that information. Then we have an idea lab where a uh, facility for carrying out innovative activities, experiments, and projects in a multidisciplinary setup for um, getting their idea into practical form. Then there is a tech lab where which excites young children specifically. It's on robotics and uh, microprocessor-based laboratory where they can work on important projects. And the main issue here is how do you mentor these children when they come to us? So we, are t uh, we have our own in-house staff as well as we are tied up with in in technical institutions and retired professors and um, um, teachers who are good in this to come and mentor these students. And we have set up now, we call them innovation clubs for children where they become members. But school curriculum pressure is so much they keep them away from such activity. But now we are opening this in the afternoons and weekends and holidays, uh, these, camp, uh, these facilities. Uh, so Hall of Fame, uh, if you look at that, uh, one of the pictures on the left side is uh, where this is the resource, um, you get talk about the picture, um, innovators and inventors. On the right side, the resource center, where one has access to all sorts of information on innovations. And then idea lab, where children work uh, with the projects. And the tech lab, of course, uh, is uh, I've already talked about. Now, what are the important issues here, uh, important component? One is the very important um, indigenous Indian idea of Tor for Jod. We call it break and make, remake. You break things, you have a television, you have a mobile, or you have any other gadget or anything, you break it, reassemble, and make it work. That's one regular activity. Another is kabar se jugar, that is make from scrap. So we, have, we generate a lot of scrap ourselves in our um, uh, facility because we built our own exhibits. So that scrap is used for making any innovative idea the children would like to work with. So the very wonderful projects have come out of this. So then we have an idea box. We ask children, any idea you have, put in the box, so we evaluate that good ideas are supported to, for uh, implementing them. Then make your own models and kits, which they have their own idea, we help them and uh, give them guidance. And short term projects, two to four months, they take a research project where they take a little more time to collect data and understand things. And uh, then we have uh, a patenting facility where we will uh, be helping children if they have a good idea which can be patented. There has been some incidents in the past where we have been able to file patents by children. So uses uh, the newly opened facility at Birla Museum in Calcutta is being used by registered members. We have registered members. Yeah. We have registered members from schools and undergraduate colleges. During weekends, they come, and uh, also on holidays. Special hands-on sessions are provided to registered groups. Special mentoring and guidance lectures are um, provided regu regularly. Participants either work on their own ideas or are to, um, one from the idea bank created collaboratively by the members. Most projects in the lab relate to real life problems identified by the students themselves. And so about 2,500 to 3,000 square foot area and we have invested about 40 lakhs which is about so, uh, less than um, uh, $7,500 uh, into creating this facility at the moment. So. Uh, and we invite people to talk, uh, Dr. Uh, Sam Petruda himself came to open this and gave a talk to children and so inspiring that the, his lecture which we recorded is being distributed to 
All the schools, they are asking for it now. It's so inspirational. They, uh, and uh, as I told you, the, uh, the facilities have been divided in four zones. We have already opened the east one, and the rest of them will be opened by February. And uh, we expect it to grow by 25 in 2017. Uh, 25 of these centers will come across the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Oshela. We've had a, a very uh, stimulating and varied set of presentations now in various aspects of education innovation. We are behind the clock, but I'm sure that if there are a couple of questions, uh, we could take them, and you might want to suggest which particular panel member you would like to address them to. Um, waiting in the wings is the chairperson of the next session, so if no one is burning with a question, we can move. Yes, there's a, sorry, have I missed somebody here? Uh, yes, there's a hand in the back there. Could you give a mic to the gentleman? Or come to a mic on the table, please, yeah? Tell us who you are and who you'd like to answer the question. So, sir, this is Siddharth from NRLM. And my question is to you and Secretary, uh, sir. Sir, uh, uh, Dr. Mashelka recently raised a question, and I'm just repeating that uh, with just a slight tweak that what is easier for the ministry to control? Is it content or the design of delivery of education? And consequently, what would it take to include stories like Agastya Foundation and Arvind I Care into the textbooks of schools. Let me ask the panelists to answer that first. Rajeshi, would you have a crack? You know, the, the, our national curriculum framework and also the RT prescribes the overall policy on the education frontier and that is to enable the child to construct his or own knowledge about the whole environment. The Content in a curriculum is decided by 35 statutory bodies which exist in our country. The national level statutory body is the NCART. What goes in and what does not go in to the curriculum in a state is decided by the State Council of Education, Research and Training. So suppose you're in Karnataka and you want Agastha Foundation experiments to be included. It is the State Council of Education, Research and Training which would in incorporate. There is a lot of scope for incorporating locally contextual material in the curriculum because that's how the child relates and understands it, including exceptional innovations which exist throughout our country. Throughout our country, you can locate local innovations and incorporate them. But main items of these are done by the state boards, the state SCRTs. For the NCRT, which governs the CBAC and other curriculum and those private schools in the states which opt for the CBAC, it is the NCRT which gets it included. And there is nothing preventing an item coming in or, uh, or going out of it. The overall parameters for that I have explained that the teaching learning method, the content curriculum absolutely has to be in accordance with the constitutional obligations and within the framework. And that's what it is. Thank you. With some variations possible is all I would add at the individual school level. And just as a school teacher can always plan an excursion that wasn't on the curriculum, there could be uh, experimental trips. Visiting the Augusta Foundation on a Saturday would be something a school teacher could do without worrying about having it thrust down uh, the curriculum track to them. But uh, we, we, we need to innovate much more in the way we do things as well as what we do. And we need to change the habits of, uh, of behavior inside the classroom. We are still a very excessively deferential society. Uh, our t students are taught to listen to the teacher, take down dutifully what the teacher says, not to challenge the received wisdom. Innovation requires the opposite, and that's why I'm so grateful for what Sam is trying to do here. We need kids to ask not just why, but why not? We need to have children reimagine and repurpose uh, the very lessons they're taught, and we need them to be able to challenge the teacher, respectfully, of course, so we don't have a discipline crisis, but not always sit into the do as you're told, listen to what we tell you approach, which characterizes much of our school education. That is a cultural change and it's slow in coming, but I think with the kind of work we're doing in innovation, we might be able to percolate down, that down a little bit. Uh, once the teachers are convinced, the students will follow. Uh, with your permission, sir, I'd just like to clarify that the textbooks or the learning books which a school purchases is totally dependent on the school as long as it doesn't violate the national curriculum framework.
that Ontario model of appraisal is really good. Why don't we have uh, annual appraisals of teachers, also like what Maharashtra Medical Council is trying to do for doctors? Is there anything of that thought in the offing or? Thank you, yeah. Go ahead, Roshi. See, the appraisal uh, part of it, there is their appraisal of the teachers uh, every year. There is no uh, problem about the appraisal. The appraisal of the teacher is done by the principal. It is given out. It is available. There is no difficulty in the appraisal. It exists. But on the first question, BA degrees being? The, uh, the teacher's qualifications, we have a National Council of Teacher Education, a statutory body which lays down the qualifications requirement of teachers at a primary and an elementary level there are certain qualifications mainly the diploma in education which is required at a secondary level a B.Ed degree is required teaching children and especially the uh, the youngest children is a very very difficult exercise uh, the type of uh, person who is required to do the teaching the methodology which has to be followed the pedagogy which has to be used the sensitivity which is required and in our environment today where we have first generation learners with practically no uh, education support in the home uh, system, we have a hugely diverse set of children in our class from various socioeconomic backgrounds. <coughs> we have a society which is intensely patriarchal to go against those grains and what are the elements which should be covered in every teaching class while at the same time not discouraging a child to do any activity or occasion for bringing down his curiosity is, uh, is an item which requires tremendous degree of understanding and professional requirements. We have an environment of immensely innovative environment today. Uh, how do I say it? We start with in a school a child in a class. A ch every child is a genius. Those are not my words. Those are the words of one of the topmost scientists in the world. It is Albert Einstein's words. We have an environment which is exceptionally innovative. Why is the word jugar there? You go around every item. If you have not gone out of Delhi, you will see encroachments. Our encroachments are violators. They, they contribute to the highest level of growth. Yes, they violate certain rights. Hernando de Soto, one of the uh, famous Mexican economists, had said how much contribution is done by, by, an, uh, by an encroacher. But what happens in the classroom? What happens in the classroom? A genius is not allowed to flower as a genius. What, what is the quality of the teacher which is there? And what is the system of recruitment of teachers? We have 85% teacher education institutions in the private sector. 40 years back, it was 100%. What have they contributed, these teacher education institutions? So much so that a Supreme Court Justice, Justice Burma Commission had to go in to bear on the quality of the teachers which they were producing. So our focus has to be to encourage a teacher to generate what are called uh, geniuses in the classroom and that's why a huge focus is there on teacher education. Just getting a degree in, in engineering or others does not qualify a person straight away. But we need to also change our teacher curriculum because today it says a beard but if you have to have a background in teaching in terms of understanding what the requirements of diverse set of learners are, what is the pedagogy to be followed for a first generation learner, you require a background on a social background, a historical background, our own background on this, you need professionals in that area to come in rather than only BA persons. There is a thinking going on that at least in the teacher educator system, where in, in, on not only MED and doctorate degrees, there should be professionals there who can talk of their relative subjects and take it forward. These are in the domain of changes being formulated by the National Council of Teacher Education. I'm glad you raised it, but it's a focus area for the MHRD and mainly the statutory body which is doing it. Thank you very much. I, I think the short answer is that whereas, as you said, an engineering student has domain knowledge in engineering, he doesn't know, he or she doesn't necessarily know how to communicate that to a child in a diverse and often backward classroom. We've heard about the importance of learning how to learn. There is also an importance of learning how to teach. And uh, Justice, the late lamented Justice Verma, when he studied 300 teacher training institutions in the state of Maharashtra, he recommended that 291 of them should be closed down, they were so bad. So we're teaching our teachers badly how to teach. You can imagine the results uh, of what, how they're going to teach our children. 
And so the great importance of maintaining certain standards, aspirational standards for our teachers, including now subjecting them to a teacher eligibility test before they can even take the first job as a, as a, as a teacher. This is a way of trying to raise standards in order to benefit education. Um, we really will sort of need to wrap this up. I know that we haven't had much of a time for discussion, but we are a little behind the clock. Innovation is a, an extremely important area of activity for all of us. Uh, education is clearly an area in which there are lots and lots of new ways in which we can learn, in which we can communicate the benefit of the learning, and where we can help teachers to communicate better and to, and to, and to instruct better. And these uh, ideas we've heard from the six panelists we've had have been of different kinds of experiences and different approaches, but they all add up to one thing, new ways of thinking, doing, and learning, and that is what this panel was seeking to do. Um, I, I want to mention one brief thought, which is the importance of incentives as well. MHRD now has national innovation scholarships being rolled out uh, in 2014 as a way of actually giving a financial incentive for innovation. And I, I want to mention in this context, my good friend, Dr. Mashelker has already been mentioned. Uh, this goes beyond education, but he has a Mashelker Award name for his late mother. Uh, which is recognizing uh, creative innovation. I, I want to stress how important this kind of thing is. And particularly in a society like India, though the Mashelkar Award is open to anybody from anybody who wants to apply. In India, the need to think out of the box is not something that people have, have completely internalized, and we need to do that. Uh, frugal innovation, I was mentioned, Jugad was mentioned by Mr. Paracharya. If you Google the words frugal innovation within quotes, your first 20 hits will all involve Indian discoveries. Um, and this has involved very intelligent repurposing of existing inventions. But as a result, we have now in India the world's cheapest electrocardiogram uh, invented here. We have the world's cheapest small car, the Tata Nano, the world's cheapest biotech products, the world's cheapest insulin injections, and so on. My challenge to our Indian innovators is these are all things other people have invented that you have simplified, made more affordable. When is India going to start thinking again, as it used to once, of things that nobody else has thought of before. I know that Dr. Mashilkar's award was for one such innovation. The first award went to somebody who invented something that nobody anywhere in the developed world had thought of, and which is applications in both the developing and the developed world. And that was a way of, and this is coming out of treating the eye ailments of poor people in slums and villages. He realized that a major challenge was that when you dilate the eye for a proper eye examination, you essentially deprive a poor person of a day's wages because they will not be able to work with dilated eyes. And he's invented a technology that enables you to do all the necessary eye tests without eye dilation drops. Uh, it was done to serve poor people in India, but with a pattern that could transform eye care in the United States and everywhere else. So this is the kind of thing we need to see more of coming from India. And I just wanted to mention that before wrapping up. That brings us to the end of this panel. Thank you to the panelists for their very cogent and effective and well-focused observations. And I want to, with great pleasure, hand over to my very good friend, the innovative film director, producer, and member of the National Innovation Council, Shekhar Kapoor, who will lead a discussion on new media and ICT platforms for innovation. Shekhar, take it away. Thank you.